This story might be too fantastic to believe, but I promise it happened. It was the last three months of 99, and my first marriage had just ended. When we began discussions, I agreed to let my ex continue to live in our house with the children. As a result, we thrust onto the market for a new home. For the time being, I was crashing in an extended stay hotel and living on fast food. Finally, as that spring approached, I found a place that I loved. The only disappointing part of the deal was that it had to have been uninhabited for going on seven years. The woman that had lived there before had died and her heirs had let it sit empty. It was eventually agreed to put it on the market and that's when I came upon it. Despite the probable long list of repairs, the price was just too good to pass up. The morning of March 3rd, I picked up the keys and signed the papers. The house was officially mine and I got to work immediately to make it livable. I replaced a broken window and a few other things before I moved in two weeks later. I hadn't been there two days before I received a visit from a pair of detectives. They sat me down and told me the craziest thing I'd heard in my life. According to them, the nice little old lady who had lived there, Sharon, had a very abusive husband named Walter. She claimed Walter left for the store one morning and never returned. Because of his history of abuse, she didn't report his disappearance. The couple's only child, Melinda, did not either. Her mother had told Walter that he had been having an affair with a woman from his job and had likely ran away to be with her. Melinda took her mother's story at face value and the woman bid Walter good riddance and moved on with their lives. Within the year, Sharon, now a free woman, began a relationship with her neighbor, Joseph Poole. She was granted a divorce and the couple were married not long after. The pair lived out their lives in this house. Not everyone was so eager to believe Sharon's story and the police were asked by Walter's sister to investigate his disappearance. Year after year, the trail always led back to Sharon, but the detectives on the case never had enough proof to arrest her. Then, about 15 years after he went missing, a new pair of detectives were put on the trail. They went back to Walter's sister, now a very old woman, and asked if she had any idea how Sharon could have disposed of her brother's body. For the first time since the case began, she recalled an incident that took place not long after Walter's disappearance. She was visiting Sharon, hoping to get some information as to where her brother had moved to, and she happened to notice a large patch of the backyard where the ground had been tilled up and roses had been planted. This struck her as odd because it was still in the middle of winter and at least four months before planting season began. I'm sure you know where this is going. The bushes would surely die in the brutal Michigan winter. She asked Sharon about this and she simply said that she wanted to get ahead of things. The sister had no reason to disbelieve her at the time and accepted the story. For the first time in a long time, the police actually had a direction to follow. However, they were frustrated by the judge's denial of a search warrant and the case soon ran out of steam, as it had so many times before. Life would then proceed and over the years, the case would be forgotten. That was until a new police chief was hired and he launched an initiative to clear the city's open cases. My visitors were assigned the case and after a little research, they discovered Sharon and her new husband had died and the house had a new owner. The reason for their visit was to ask if I would allow them to dig up the yard to look for Walter's remains. I was naturally shocked by all of it and I needed time to think about it. After taking a few days to consider the request, I gave them the okay. The following morning, 20 or so cops accompanied by a backhoe began their search. I want to say I was surprised by what they found, but after hearing their story, Walter's skeleton being discovered was almost expected. At the end of the day, everything seemed to work out for the best. The cops managed to close a 50 year old mystery and Walter got to be put away alongside his loved ones. The only downside was Walter's sister didn't live to see it. She deserved to be there for the funeral after all the time she put into the search for him. This situation has made me do a lot more thinking since it was brought to my attention. From all reports, old Walter was not good to his wife or the respected marriage. 
Maybe Sharon had a good reason to put an end to his crap. The problem I have with what she did is that by killing Walter and hiding his body away in the garden, his innocent sister, who had hurt nobody, was left with the terrible notion that she and the rest of his family had been abandoned by him for a young piece of tail. Then, as time carried on, she had come to terms with the strong possibility that her brother was indeed dead. She had nowhere to go to mourn him, and that, my friends, is just not right. I was on my postal route one morning when I got the idea. A small part of my route cuts through this old abandoned neighborhood. At the end of a cul-de-sac sits this decrepit two-story house, something like you'd see in an old horror movie. This is where I was going to do it. You see, I have this friend, Philip. We are part of a ghost hunting group in our spare time. It's a pastime I really enjoy and derive a lot of excitement from. Philip, however, is terrified of anything supernatural. Something as average as a cheesy ghost video on YouTube scares the crap out of him. I'll never understand why he puts himself through one of our investigations. I asked him once why he did it, and he said it was his way to face his fears, something he'd heard about on TV. This put the kernel of an idea in my head. When I saw the house, it grew into a full-blown plan. I was going to pull a joke on Philip. When it was over, hopefully his fear of spooky things would be defeated. Anytime I can get a good laugh and help a friend at the same time seemed like a win-win to me. I called him up at the afternoon and told him we had a new house to investigate that Friday night. He sounded excited and I couldn't help but laugh knowing just what I had in mind for him. I had two days to get what I needed and set everything up. I'd stop in during my route and look for the best places to rig my equipment. There were signs of people, but from all I could see, they had not been around for a long time. Finally, Friday night came. After work, I parked my car a few streets over and walked over to the house. I wasn't expecting Phil for another hour I took this time to complete any last minute tasks. I got done with 15 minutes to spare and crawled into my hiding place. Within minutes, I heard footsteps approaching outside. I bit my lip to stifle my giggling. I had never felt so much like a child at that moment. Mere seconds after I heard the footsteps, my phone vibrated with a text message. It was Philip. He said he was held up by a train near his apartment and was running late. This was bad news. Phil lived almost 30 minutes away. I'd have to lay crunched up in my hidey hole even longer. The steps entered the house, echoing down the massive hallway. Wait a minute. This is when it hit me. If Philip was a half hour away, who was here? Voices of at least two men came bouncing down the hall toward me. One man had noticed my equipment and sounded very angry. I heard loud bangs a few seconds later from what I can assume was my stuff being smashed. The second man had a slight slur to his voice and his words were far more aggressive. If I find out who did this crap, I'm gonna cut his head off and put it on a pole outside. Maybe that will keep people out. My heart began beating like it was trying to break loose from my body. I wasn't sure what they were capable of and hoped they would leave without realizing that I was still there. I did my best to not make any noise. I continued to listen, and then I heard something dreaded. One of the men, the drunk one, found my bag. I had stuck it in a hole under the stairs to hide it. Even then, I wasn't sure they knew I was still there, at least until the other man began calling for me to come out. He said if I made them look, they were going to make me sorry when they found me. All doubt was removed from that statement. I could hear them going from room to room, opening closets and doors. They were a few rooms away, and I decided I need to get the hell out of there, that second. When I heard them enter the room next to me, I made a break for it. I didn't dare look back, and within seconds, I could hear footfalls behind me. So I pushed myself even harder. It seemed to work. The closer I got to my car, the footfalls seemed to grow quieter. Still, even then, I didn't dare slow down. I ran around to the driver's side of my car and unlocked the door as fast as I could. This was my first look at my two pursuers. 
I was pleased to see them almost 100 yards behind me. They were gasping and fighting for every breath. I wasn't taking any chances though. I started my car and tore out of there without looking back ever again. That is when I remembered Philip was on his way. I made up some quick BS text and sent it to him. I did so just in time. I was four or five blocks from the house when we met each other across the intersection. He pulled up to me and I began spitting some yarn about a wrong address. He must have believed it. He shrugged his shoulders, turned around and headed for home. I followed him for about a mile just to make sure they turned off from my own place. To my knowledge, Philip still has no idea how close he was to being assaulted by an angry pair of squatters. The same likely applies to the practical joke I was planning. After my run in with them, things got put into perspective. I realized the joke was a childish thing to do in the first place. I put stupid stuff like that behind me now. I'm in no position to tell folks how to live their lives. If he wants to live in fear, that's his choice. God knows there's plenty of things out there to be afraid of.